Uh, it is so good to be uh, here with you, uh, my friends. We have been in this work together, some of us a little longer than others, but we have been in it together. So uh, it is a privilege and an honor to be here uh, at CBAC for the first, to be at CBAC for the first time. Uh, and just uh, Sister Joe and all the folks uh, um, to get me uh, here, which uh, I am a bit slippery. And so, uh, but I wanted to say thank you uh, to all the folks who worked to get me here. And then, uh, where is our sister president, uh, Reverend uh, Stone King? Where is she here? She's down in the lodge. So I just want to raise uh, her name. Uh, the uh, director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation and then my dear brother, Jonathan Lewis, uh, we've trained together uh, in Baltimore uh, in, right after uh, the Freddie Gray rebellions. And so I want to say thank you to uh, him and the folks from Portland who I was just with. And then to these young folks who are what we've been waiting on. who are what we've been waiting on, and so we are thankful for, and we have high expectations of you. And that the civilization is in a crisis, and you might be its salvation if it can be saved. And so we have extremely high expectations of you. I want to take a few moments, although I'm a third generation Pentecostal preacher, I'll attempt to be uncharacteristically brief. <laughs> but I want to just take a few minutes and then we'll open it up to some democratic dialogue. But I want to wrestle with three questions. What is this moment? Who is the Fellowship of Reconciliation? And what is the role of youth? What is this moment? Who is the Fellowship of Reconciliation? And what is the role of youth? So this particular moment in which we exist in is characterized by the collapse of the global economy of 2008, where overnight, literally 40 million people go into poverty. And so with the collapse of the global economy, we see emergence, various forms of people who have been historically othered and find themselves living on the outside with, deg with varying degrees of privilege in the context of the American empire. And so we see in the context of the Glo Arab Spring, whereby folks are rebelling against the various regimes that have suppressed their dignity in the framework of a failure of modernity. And so it is not a class of civilizations, but rather it is a contradiction in terms based on the assumption that modernity would bring one comfort and ease. So it is not a rebellion against modernity. It is about a failure of modernity. When you look at many of the suicide bombers, many of them have master's degrees from foreign countries. They have gone inside the colonial empires and gained various forms of access and education. And when they return to their homes after being abroad, they find the same dictator that was in power when they left is still there. And so the promise of modernity, the promise of Western civilization has not yielded fruit. And so within this context, we see the same thing with the Occupy movement, white brothers and sisters finding out what we've been trying to tell you for about 400 years. The system's working just fine, just for a few. And so white brothers and sisters find themselves in a context after the, the collapse of the global economy and the failure of modernity impacting their own lives. They make two options, the Tea Party, which is about 
a right sensibility with the wrong conclusion. No, they shouldn't have bailed out the banks. They shouldn't have bailed out the corporation. They should have bailed out mainstream. And so this popular sensibility that rejects the way in which neoliberalism has attempted to prop itself up given its own collapse, the sensibility is right. But the conclusion, the conclusion is wrong, predicated on what W.E.B. Du Bois called the psychological wages of whiteness. So we might be white, we may be poor, but we're white. I mean, and so we're not niggers. And so they begin to lobby and leverage their social anxiety mediated by the fin financialization of the economy upon black bodies. This is the moment that we're in. And that there's been a certain resurgence of right-wing reactionary forces and that we live in a moment in American history where the stating of the obvious becomes a revolutionary act. Black life matters. And so we live in a nation so recalcitrant that the uttering of the words of black life matters helps to give language and discursive wings to the anxieties and the doings and sufferings of a people. And then in that context that you can't understand Ferguson outside of the context of this global collapse of the economy as well as the globalization of capital in which various forms of elites have engaged in various forms of repression together through their military apparatus. And so when I was in Palestine in 2012, there was tear gas shot at us. And there were military, uh, Israeli tactics ran upon Palestinian bodies. And when I was in the streets of Ferguson, same military tactics. Same tear gas company that makes the tear gas that was shot at us in Palestine, makes the tear gas that was shot at us in Ferguson. This is about a global phenomenon, the way in which global capital is shifting around the world and supporting various regimes. And so this is the moment. And so what does it mean to be the Fellowship of Reconciliation in this moment? And I want to begin my assessment of the Fellowship of Reconciliation with the work of the great A.J. Musty, who frames it, who was not perfect, let us be clear, but who offers this notion of revolutionary pacifism which is predicated on nonviolence with ideology, because nonviolence without ideology is vacuous. You can have not, we see it in Europe, the deployment of Gene Sharp's te uh, techniques in velvet revolutions, which are about expanding markets under the guise of democratic freedom. It's not to valorize, not to say that our socialist comrades regimes were just, but it is to say that the way in which the words democracy and capitalism have become one, they're exchangeable. It's very much like religion, conservative, right, religious, and Republican, like it, and Christian. You change them all in a sentence, but it don't change the meaning of the sentence. And so democracy has become synonymous with capitalism in this context and in this moment. And so what is the role of a nonviolent organization in, in this particular context, given its largely white body and the older generation of leaders? What role are you going to play at this particular moment in history? Because you have a role to play. And part of it is at the ideological level, so we want to make a connection between nonviolence and some forms of checks on global capital. Now, myself, I am a bourgeois socialist. <laughs> I'm a member of the Democratic Socialists of America, and there's a certain room for me there. 
I mean, I'm the, uh, one of, uh, I'm a Gramscian. I take serious the culture of everyday people. What are the ways in which people are deploying their cultural sensibilities in the face of circumstances not of their own choosing and combating Herculean forms of death, dread, and despair? And so the way in people deploy their culture becomes a very, a very critical way for us to understand. And so in understanding the way in which culture plays a role, how does the culture FOR be deployed in such a way that it has a lasting impact on a younger generation of, of folks? What is your proximity to young people in your own communities, in your own chapters? Because part of the history of the Fellowship of, uh, uh, the Fellowship of Reconciliation is to assess the political terrain and make certain calculated choices about what was the best way to deploy our resources in the context of a social movement and then get out the way. <laughs> that is who we are. Whether it be beginning, uh, going backwards, if you, uh, so will, if, if you will, in time, going backwards in time, you think about the role that many of you all played in the sanctuary movement. It was many of you, your churches, your relationships, who understood the way in which the American empire was exacting its political forces uh, and military might on the bodies of Nicaraguans and folk from Guatemala and understanding that you had a moral and ethical obligation by, f by virtue of the fact that your tax dollars were paying for the destruction of their homes. So many of you risked your lives and your careers and your institutions. You did that. That is who you are. It is in that context that we understand better the roles in which you have to play now. That you hold space and time in such a way that you can depart a level of wisdom to young folks. And given the fact that there is a level of disdain and hatred not only for youth but also for the old. Because in America, we're obsessed with new, a nation that is obsessed with the new while eating its young. So what's new? What, what, what is the new app? What is the, 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 the way in which the market structures itself that you have to buy one phone to get the, uh, in order to get the charger that you need, right? All of these kind of market constructions that impact the way in which we understand ourselves and the way in which we consume is in the very air that we breathe. And you have the capacity to beat that back because you've been doing it for so long. That's what you can do. That is who you are as the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And so then lastly, what is the role of youth? What responsibility do they have in this historical context? How do we assess them? And this is not to valorize youth. It's not to say that youth is perfect and has no contradictions. It's not to fetishize youth, nor should we fetishize eldership. And so part of our responsibilities, now I'm not an elder, I'm just old. <laughs> I, said, I said, I'm not, I'm not an elder, I'm old. <laughs> But part of our assessment as elders is that we cannot engage in nostalgia with young people. We can't give them a mythos and set them up against a myth. And much of what is happening among an older generation who feel that some of us have passed our time, we have not been secure in our own work. 
We don't believe we did enough, and which is the truth, we did not. We never do, we never can. But we had to live a little bit, have a little joy in our lives. But nostalgia is a form of mourning, Slavoj Zizak, the great philosopher, posits. That nostalgia is a form of mourning because the present is unbearable and the future unforeseeable. And so we have certain romantic notions about everybody of a certain age march with Martin Luther King. That everybody was on the bridge in Selma. <laughs> right? If all the people were on the bridge who say they were on the bridge, the daggum thing would have collapsed. <laughs> so, no nostalgia. Let's tell them the truth. Emil Cabral, the great revolutionary from Guinea-Bissau, says that we can tell no lies and claim no easy victories. So let's not lie to them. Let's tell them the ugly truth of our failures and our mistakes and our contradictions and our betrayals. Let's tell them the truth. And then the task on the part of young people is that you're not the first generation of young folks to be catching hell. There's a story bigger than you and older than you, of some people with limited resources who somehow seized history and bent it to their wills. That there are some people and that you're part of a rich tradition of men and women who made decisions about how they were gonna live their lives and that you are keepers of the tradition. Now, we do not mean tradition is, I believe Eliot means it when, he, when Eliot tells us that tradition is not something that is simply passed down from generation to generation. If so, tradition is something that should cease to exist. But tradition is not inherited, but is acquired with great labor. So y'all got to put some work in. Mao Zedong tells us that revolution is not having a tea party or simply writing a poem. So cast away your illusions and prepare for struggle. So this is a rich tradition, but it requires labor. You got to put in some work. There is no resting on your laurels about what you used to do. And I, you see, I'm a Pentecostal. We got some of this African magic on our tradition. And so I believe that when you make that decision, the stars align up on your behalf. And the moon will be at your beck and call. But you got to do it out of love. Hate can't guide you, baby. You got to love your way out of this. I know many of us are angry at the systems that produced us, the lies that we've been told, the level of betrayal by this new Zion. The city on the hill, the light into the world, the lie that's been told to us about it. And so we're angry. And it's all right to be angry. Because if you ain't angry, you ain't paying attention. <laughs> you 
I'd just be like, God. Really? <laughs> Is this what y'all going to do? In 2015, it's literally going to be a national conversation about taking down the American swastika. <laughs> We're actually going to have a national debate about it. That's enough to make you mad. But you just can't let it have the last. You got to love your way out. A wise man once told me that love is remembering the song in someone's heart and singing it to them when they've forgotten it. And so our relationship with American democracy, according to James Baldwin, is an artist's quarrel with his nation or her nation or their nation is a lover's quarrel. We must remind America to be true to what she said on paper. And so you got to love your way through that. And so part of that, particularly for a younger generation, given the level of uh, capacity to communicate in real time vis-a-vis -vis Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat, which are features of the market, <laughs> and so that given the fact that part of our struggle is to, a uh, story tells that he wakes up every morning trying to squeeze the slave out of himself drop by drop, that we're trying to get this stuff out of us that's been in us. We're trying to get it out of us. And so sometimes we engage in the very behaviors of the empire in our movements and with one another. So the empire shames people of color, it shames queer folks, it shames the elderly, it shames young people. And so then we respond in kind by shaming one another. And you can't shame your comrades. You build out real space and real time where you can go directly to one another and air out your contradictions. Twitter and Facebook are not the place for that. But you got to, and now this is not to say, I mean, if some of these old folk in here knew how to work Twitter, they'd be shaming each other too. <laughs> so I'm not, you know what I'm saying? They grandbaby ain't showed them how to work on Twitter yet, but as soon as they grandbaby show them, they're gonna be wearing each other out. So it's not to say they got, we wanna romanticize it, you know, elderly, right? And old folk, and I saw old folk as a term of endearment because that's who raised me. I was raised by old people. My grandmother and her friends, Miss Roberta, who couldn't write her name. We say, come here, read to me, boy, about our people. She had old snuff buckets she used to spit in. Those are the people who raised me, my grandmother and her friends, these elders who had seen time and space and had weathered the storm. Because part of being an elder is that you've weathered the storm. Life has thrown everything it could at you and you still here. And that's a gift to young people. Because their stories, it's not just simply the techniques and the uh, uh, the, the, the tactical aspects of the movement is about how people have lived their lives and had joy. All the stories I could tell you <laughs> about people who've lived. And so you gotta live. So our request to you young people is simply to love and to live. Live. This is not a lifestyle, it is your life. It's not something you can buy in the store. There is no app for it. <laughs> you just live. And you make mistakes and you have all kinds of contradictions. But you live.
And so in the context of what is this moment, it is a moment characterized by the global collapse of the economy, the ways in which capitalism has a certain kind of crisis. And who are we as the Fellowship of Reconciliation? Part of our task is to construct a kind of what we have, the term we've been using is a militant nonviolence to a disobedience, a revolutionary nonviolence that has an ideology to connect it to it that accounts for the ways in which capitalism is insufficient to respond to the needs of, of other humans in such a way that is just and peaceful. <laughs> A revolutionary nonviolence, a militant nonviolence, civil disobedience that is about the direct confrontation with the state, which is carving out a political space where there's a moral drama, a moral crisis that pricks the conscience of public policymakers, elites, and the nation. We are not sure if they still have a conscience, but we're engaging in a Pascalian wager, a leap of faith over time and space to say that we're gonna stake it all. So who are we as the Fellowship of Reconciliation? And part of that requires of us to have a racial analysis. You can't talk about anti-nuclear weapons and not talk about the level of racist ideology that went into bombing Japanese into oblivion. Can't talk about nuclear weapons and peace and not talk about the ways in which uranium and nuclear plants are poisoning the land of Native Americans and black folks down in the South. You just can't have that conversation anymore. It is unacceptable. In fact, it's tacky. <laughs> like Ku Klux Klan outfits, you know. They're just simply tacky. I mean, really, you gonna wear that outside? <laughs> it's tacky. And so you have to have, be able to have a conversation with a racialized and with, with the way in which race, that race must read and color everything you do in America from this day forward. And that means you don't get a chance to be an ally. You gotta be a freedom fighter. But you have to understand that racism has run you crazy. There's a certain madness. Do you remember the, in the mid 80s, under Reagan, all of the air traffic controllers who lost their jobs you remember many of the high level suicide among them. High level suicide during the crash of Wall Street, high level suicides uh, in 2008 in the collapse of the global economy because it was the madness of the empire. It runs you crazy. And so part of your own personal salvation is finding you some way to be in solidarity with poor black folks catching hell you just might get saved. <laughs> and that's part of what it is, your own salvation. is. It's not outside of you, it's not foreign to you, it's not those other people, it is inside you, the empire. Desire is your very soul. This is what Foucault is talking about in Discipline and the Punishment when he makes the argument that the discipline of the, goes from the body into the soul in the French prison systems in the 1700s, 1800s offering us some kind of universal insight on this particular moment in terms of that what the empire is after not only is our land and our resources, but it wants our soul. And this soul is not necessarily connected to a holy other, but it is to say, those of us who are believers, we have to believe like we've never believed before. because this is a monster that we're dealing with. And we created it, we left this for these young folks. We need to struggle to ensure that they're gonna be all right. And so you need to be freedom fighters. 
You're right, some of your marching days are over. But you can work the phones for jail support. You can raise some money for these babies. You can look after them. Go by and see about them. Make sure they got a little book money. You okay, baby? And love on them. You can do that. You can admit about what you know and what you don't know. Because you were young ones. Now, to be sure, we wouldn't trade to be 20-something again. <laughs> I mean, we wouldn't go back. <laughs> Not with what we know now. <laughs> and if we did, we'd be too dangerous. <laughs> So we fine. <laughs> Y'all can have them 20 somethings. You know what I'm saying? And if we can't do it anymore, they got a pill for it. <laughs> Make you see better everything. We, we gonna keep moving. But we do want to say that part of your responsibility is that you have to be in relationship with young folks. And young folks, you gotta be in relationship with elders. In real ways, in deep, authentic ways. Because we need you. And we need each other. Thank you. Would, would you please tell us what one day is like uh, in Ferguson, the mechanics of your day and uh, some of your experience there? Okay. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So uh, uh, let, well, let's take this other one, too. Very simple question, Reverend. Yes. Um, so, this is my first time at the FOR, and I'm planning to work with the Oregon um, chapter. And mm -hmm. um, what can we do? Basic things like Black Lives Matter 101. Mm, got it. So two things, because they're, they're, they're connected. So my, it depends on what day of the week it is. <laughs> so I mean, if it's in August, <laughs> you know, it's in the street. Uh, trying to keep young folks safe, getting tear gas, rubber bullets, you know, in August, right? Um, you know, around the indictment, same thing. It's burning buildings. It's um, young people in the street, mass arrest. I mean, it's a day, this daily harassment by the police for most of the organizers. Uh, they're still making arrests. There's still a number of protests happening every day. Uh, it's the longest rebellion against police brutality in U.S. history. Second only to the Montgomery bus boycott. Nine months longer than the Selma campaign. These young people on fire. All right, so we, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of meetings with various organizing forces. Uh, uh, a lot of time at a place called Mocha Bees. It's uh, this lesbian sister, Mo, runs it, and it's become the holiest place in all of Ferguson. Because it's the place we come and we sit and we gather. And she looked at it, it was tear gassed uh, twice. Um, but it's a wonderful and beautiful place. All her kids work there. And she's a badass. <laughs> I think Mo about 63. You know, and she a badass. Like part of a, we got a lawsuit against the uh, police, St. Police, St. Louis Police Department about through in the federal courts around a temporary restraining order about they need to make a certain amount of announcements before they use chemical agents. Cause they was giving out, <laughs> they was giving out tear gas like it was hotcakes. <laughs> You know, so uh, 
Yeah, I was just thinking, man, this is man, these fireworks are not gonna get along tonight, you know. I had a serious case of PTSD, you know, all the sounds, the bombs. They got this thing called a hornet's nest. They spent about thirty five thousand on them. Hornet's nest. Now when they throw it in the crowd, right, it goes boom. You know, not hearing is enough to make you go home. And it flashed. So it go boom and flash. So you can't hear and you can't see. Then it releases a chemical agent. So you can't breathe. And it shoot rubber bullets. All at the same time. On American soil. Yes, against us. <laughs> I remember one night they shot it, and it kind of, you know, it hits the ground, and it bounced, like you know how you skip a rock? So when it, when it bounced uh, and went up in the air, the rubber bullets start flowing out like this. It looked like it was walking. And we were like, what the? <laughs> Is this Transformers? <laughs> like, they done went futuristic on us. <laughs> like, what is this? I was like, okay, we'll see y'all tomorrow night. <laughs> y'all won tonight. <laughs> we're gonna go ahead and say, we're gonna let y'all have this one. We're coming back out tomorrow night. So that's the day in the life of Ferguson. Uh, on the question of, um, I mean, the issue is that, like, with one of the things the FOR has done with, uh, with the, the work that we've done has been providing infrastructure. And that's very easy for us to do. So, look, look oh, there we go. There we go. So, uh, so uh, if we, um, we provide infrastructure, right? So, uh, some of our staff will go in, we'll do the civil disobedience training, show them how to run a, a local action. Um, help run jail support, set up the medics, that kind of thing. These folks can do that. They can help set up infrastructure. Like if you're gonna be running, if uh, Don't Shoot Portland's gonna be running an action, they can run the infrastructure for you. And if some of them choose to come into the street, some of them choose to come into the street. You know, that's, that's real simple. They know how to do that. They've been doing this for 57 years. They know how to organize stuff. Questions of the, you know, and I think they're willing. They can run infrastructure, no problem. And, you know, some of them got a little access, am I right? Y'all know a few fancy folks, some potentates. You probably go to church with some of them, right? So they can, they can just lean over, and over, over the aisle and tell the city councilman, come on now. Don't do that to them babies. They, yeah. They can run infrastructure and they can, you know, because part of it is that, that part of it, that no revolutionary revolution functions entirely without the betrayal of certain elites. The folks who have access have to participate in it. Everything from the Haitian Revolution, right? You know, Toussaint, his comrade, Desaline, Desaline's an elite. Well, Toussaint's an elite, right? Certain level of betrayal. So th th that's just the reality. I mean, it's crude. Those are crude kind of calculated Marxist formulations. But they're also, in reality, part of what we're dealing with in terms of to have, at some point, we have to have some way to step back and have some, not necessarily objective lens, be able to look at it in some, at times with kind of cold calculated terms. Because we are in a war. They are killing my people every other day in America. The level of domestic violence and assault on women out of this world. I mean, we got gay marriage, but it ain't like the Supreme Court outlawed homophobia. A lot of homophobia, we got transphobia. I mean, we're at war, and so we do need people who to kind of, kind of run that infrastructure. And at some level, in terms of revolutionary struggle, they need to be invisible. 
Somebody need to know that. And so those are the ways in which I think they can support. We got another way, yeah, Vanna. But Bob. Right there. Yeah, no, no, no. I got two. Give me, give me this young baby here. There's a, this baby right here. And then give me this baby right here. Hi. As a older 20-something, um, when I... No such thing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Contradiction in turn. Oxymoronic. With coming out of college and starting grad school and talking to peers, they get exasperated when I try to talk about anything other than climbing out of their own debt and their own holes. Mm -hmm. How do we get people involved my age now, where, into Tell me where you, where you at? Portland. Oh, there's plenty of young folks. There's a lot of young folks no. when we're talking about getting them into a movement rather than just showing up at an event. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, well, I think when you think about, did I see you in Portland? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Who else did I see in Portland? Who else did I see? My God. Portland's in the house. Portland. Portlandia. The capital of hipsterdistan. Boy, it's hipsters everywhere in Portland. I'm like, I ain't get it. I mean, and among hipsters, coffee houses are like liquor stores in black communities. <laughs> it's one on every corner. I mean, but I appreciate Portland there. I mean, so in a place like Portland, there's plenty of organizing. I'm just saying, you may just be, I, like, I mean, there were several thousand people definitely involved in the civil rights movement, but it wasn't like everybody. That's one of the lies they tell. You know, they're just like everybody, just like you just had white black panthers walking around in suburban America. Just not true. And so part of that is that maybe to kind of wrestle with the ideal of where your comrades at and where the social work. So but don't shoot Portland right there. They got plenty of young folk. There's Black Life Matters in Portland. Yeah, there's plenty of folks. There's some interesting evangelicals who are trying to wrestle with this question. Yeah, Portland got plenty. So, and... I mean, at one level, the Marxist formulation would say that out of quantity, quality comes out of quantity, right? And I'm not necessarily convinced of that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure. Just a few folk willing to risk all. And it gets contagious, you know what I'm saying? That if you got a few folks who are willing to take some significant risk, that might be able to build it uh, out. And then some folks just going to sleepwalk. But we struggle for them, too. We struggle for those who shall not shed any blood, whose lives will have been comfortable even until now. We struggle for them, too, because it's the right thing to do. Because we don't ever want to be them, them other people. I mean, this is one of the reasons why nonviolence as a principle, has a certain appeal to me. Because we don't want to be them. I don't want to have, I don't want to put on riot gear. I don't want to lock up children. I don't want to discriminate against a whole body of people. I don't want to be that. And so we struggle for their own salvation. Now, that, at one level, that sounds a bit vanguardist. But Vanguard is usually make an argument for a structure of a certain class, a certain set of elites, typically the intellectuals, as the leaders of the revolution. We don't know where it's coming from. In Ferguson, there's some poor black kids who many folks will clutch their purses when they see them walking by. Kids with tattoos on their face and sag their pants and say, fuck the police, them. They the only reason I'm here having this conversation with you, because of them. And so we don't know where it's going to come from. We just go, we do the work. To be a bit biblical, we cast our bread on the water. 
Christianity talk about we speak a word and it not returning void. That's what we do. And so part of our, uh, uh, what you're gonna have to come to terms with is, yeah, it's gonna be lonely and isolating. And you're gonna go like, I should be really doing something else. This whole struggle for justice <laughs> just ain't that lucrative. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, they you know, they may take a shot at me or something. You know what I mean? I might reconsider. Right? But that's part of what you do, baby. But there are plenty of folks, and we put in, you talk to them folks from Don't Shoot. Habibi. What's up, baby? Hey, how you doing? <laughs> good, good. Uh, um, uh, now, I was wondering, in terms of uh, efficiency and effectiveness, mm -hmm. would it be better for everyone to be focusing on one sole topic and putting their energy to solving that type topic or crisis or conflict, mm -hmm. or spreading out to cover a wider basis? Well, I think it's what folks are already working, right? So, and I, well, one, if you're gonna, I, I, and I say this lovingly, if you're gonna be an organizer, you have to de dispel yourself of the myth of effective and efficient. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, not. <laughs> you're gonna set yourself up for failure. <laughs> If you think you're going to be effective and efficient? <laughs> yeah, we've been on the lows and sides for much of this, this battle, dear brother. But we keep on struggle, so I would want you to consider the term of faithful. Right, what are we going to be faithful to, even when we're losing? Right? It's just like, you know, I... You know, I don't endorse presidential candidates anymore, right? It's not like they're clamoring for it anyway. <laughs> like they go, nobody's going, you know, nobody's going, like, what does Sekou think, right? But I endorse, you know what I'm saying? I endorse Nader and Kucinich. I mean, those are not winning tickets, you know what I'm saying? But we want to be faithful. Right. And so part of what are the ways in which we can faithful, but at the same time acknowledging that we have a certain set of fiduciary responsibilities, limited resources that need to be deployed, and that folks are humans, they can't work 24 hours a day. Right? You know, I can get about 22 in. <laughs> I'm gonna need a nap. <laughs> you know? And so I think one way we do that, I, I think that also has to do with what proximity is, right? So if you just kind of make an assessment, because I reject the evangelical model, we're going to go and bring something to somebody. People are already on the move. The question is, where are they moving? How can we be in proximity to that movement, right? That's, they're already on the move. Well, you, don't to, you don't ever have to worry about it. Every, you know, since the first African got off the boat, we've been like, oh, this is some bullshit. <laughs> 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 no. No, it ain't going down like that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's who we are. We've been resisting. So people are always on the move. So given our proximity, right? So we've been doing a significant amount of work. You'll hear more about it in the National Report. And the Black Lives Matters work in Cleveland and Baltimore and Ferguson. And we've been in Portland. And we got various folks uh, around the country. Well, we've trained Hartford, Connecticut. We set up the help set up the Moral Mondays project there. Uh, and so we've, we've just been showing up and providing infrastructure. And so some of the pre-existing relationships exist already, right? So what is the Oregon? Let me, let me see the Oregon chapter, everybody from Oregon. The Oregon chapter. And so that's the Oregon chapter. Now, see, now ra there go, and then raise your hand for uh, Don't Shoot uh, Portland, right there. See, see the Don't Shoot Portland people? There you go. That's who you organize with. They're already doing the work. You provide the infrastructure. That's all. Where Washington at? Let me see the Washington chapters. Okay. Now, uh, now, where them babies at? Show me where them babies at. Let me see the baby's hand. Don't see the. All right. There you go. That's it. You see them? Go, go organize. 
That's all. It's not lot. You know what I'm saying? So this and so the, and so and because where the young folks are and where the new formations are, don't shoot Portland as a new formation have emerged out of a context that there's been a vacuum that they feel because traditional nonprofit civil rights organizations have not been able to assess this moment. So don't shoot as a new formation. That's what we see in Ferguson, a lot of new formation. You just, it's not going to be able, you can't go to the traditional sites of engagement right now because they're failing terribly. I mean, we got a few revolutionary forces inside the NAACP, like our dear sister, Sister Jackie, right? We got a few radical forces inside pushing the national agenda, right? But it's going to vary from chapter to chapter. Locals tend to be more radical than the nationals. Right, but North Carolina looks different than Tennessee, very different. Right, so I'm saying is that where's the traction and where's the movement at? So right now, at this moment in the, uh, in the U.S. history, the Black Lives Matters thing is the best thing we got going. I mean, just beyond, you know, some poor black folks have set the, set the national agenda, which we haven't seen since the slave insurrections, where lump and proletariat are dictating the ways in which public policies are reverberating in and outside of even the White House. President got to, had to meet with a kid named T-Dub who got tattoos on his face. It's a different moment, right? So the traction is there. That's the best thing we got going. And then if you do a racialized lens, you got the capacity to look at everything and fully understand America, right? And then, which has internationalist implications, right? So in addition to focusing on that, they're like, for, it's on the question of Palestine. Yeah. And on the question of Palestinian self-determination and the position of boycott, divestment, and the sanctions. The movement in the U.S. is going to have to make a decision. Why? Because the, Israel, the consensus around Israel has been broken. Right? There's, a, there's a broken, and this is not to be anti-Semitic. This is not to demonize Jewish brothers and sisters. Right? It's not, not at all. Israeli working class, Israeli left, under significant amount of repression inside 48. Those are my comrades, I support them. Right, anti-Jewish sentiment in Russia, we must say something. But the threat to Jewish identity has never been the global south, it has always been Europe. Always. And so in that context, how do we keep track of the various forms of misery and suffering among various ethnically uh, identified people who have lived on the night side of oppression? But we can't talk about Israel and Palestine in this particular context, with, in, Fer in the context of Ferguson, because Israeli tactics were run on us in Ferguson. Can't talk about them in that. You can't, they're not isolated. It was the Palestinians who tweeted us and told us how to deal with tear grass. Right? 250 Palestinians marched with us in the streets of Ferguson. Mm -hmm. Never been a question. And the most radical, some of the most radical forces in Ferguson are anti-Zionist Jewish brothers and sisters. So you can't have a conversation now. You can't, you can't, you can't avoid it. And so the movement is going to have to take some position. So I think part of, one of the, what we've began to see a clear connection between black and Palestine. You know, a whole group from Ferguson went to Palestine. Tef Poe went to Palestine. Tara went to Palestine. Dream Defenders went to Palestine. Recently, like in the last five months. Right? So, so inside, so at the, in, in terms of the like, kind of base level of the movement, the people are already on the move. And I've already made a connection to the question of the Palestine. So in addition to, yes, I think in the context, I'm, ba I'm betting on. Now, again, I voted for uh, Kusinaj and Snader, so I may not be a winner. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, I'm t giving you this advice. This is not legal advice. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It is to say that there is a connection between the two. And that we have to have both uh, international, you know, anti-imperialist, feminist critiques in all of our work, which is going to determine the various sites in which we're going to be engaging in struggle. Next question. Yeah. So the personal is my question. 
This mm -hmm. is about the personal, not the movements, not the institutions. When we're trying to overcome what we may have caused ourselves or what our society caused, if you don't want your differences to be the sole basis of your relationship with someone, but you find that as an activist, that's all you have a choice to do is to say, I need to talk to you about Black Lives Matter, and I only talk to you about being black, or being black, or my not being black, then we do not create a relationship that is other than our demographic. So I'm trying to figure out when you have a short amount of time and things are crucial, and you want to jump to what are we going to do about this, and your solution is to talk about how you, I don't know, I'm clearly I can't even state this question well, but I think you grok the gist of what I want to say. Mm. When on a personal level, not an institutional level, not a movement level, you want to move things forward with everyone that you see, and all you talk about is that you're black and I'm white, or all I talk about, mm. or I'm Jewish and you're not, or I'm middle class and you're poor, or actually I'm poor and you're mm. middle class, mm. then... Um, <laughs> No, I'm not middle class. Yeah, but okay, it's, it was that bourgeois thing. Mm -mm. So, um, um, are you grokking my question? Yes. Okay, yeah. I'll leave it. Well, I think that, I mean, I mean, I think there are a couple of things. One, yeah, I quite don't know how to sparse that one. Because, I mean, it's just, it's just basically, I don't, I don't, I don't, there's a certain, underlying Cartesian dichotomy that I just don't buy. It's predicated on a didactic and a binary of difference. So I'm, I'm suspicious of the binary. Let's make it a <laughs> well, I'm, I'm meaning that I'm just, I, we just are who we are. I'm a black man in black skin in a racist society who likes European suits and has dreadlocks. That's just who I am. That's just who I am. Like, it's no like, and so when you're talking to myself, myself is black, right? My, the way in which I've constituted myself has been constituted in a certain set of historical circumstances, not of my own choosing. I'm just who I am, right? Because part of what the empire does is that it, it commodifies it breaks apart, it fetishizes certain parts of our being outside of our ontology in such a way that we're never a whole self. So, well, I just see you for you, uh, you know, no, see me, all of me. And so if I want to talk about race, I want to talk about race. And if that's all I want to talk about, that's all I want to talk about. If I'm a queer person, a transgender person, a, a youth, that's my identity. That's cause of the hell I'm catching. It ain't an option for me, right? A lot of times people who, have, who don't deal with the suffering and misery of the world are the ones who have the option not to. But they're those of us who we have no choice. We come out the womb. I mean, to be black in America is to be born against the odds. So we fighting in the womb. And then we hit the set. They got tests for us, regulating it. Put you in Louisiana, they uh, base prison cells on prison beds on how many, on third grade test scores. We come out the gate, they coming for us. Just so it ain't no option. And if we can't become friends around that, I don't want to be your friend. <laughs> I mean, it's the truth. I want you to know, you know what I'm saying? Imagine having a high part of who you were to be with your best friend in the whole wide world, somebody you love. I just can't bring that up. <laughs> right? Say it, brother. All right, you can't. You don't want that kind of relationship. So, and so you can and get, you're gonna, so, cause much of it is part of shaping of who we are. And so, and I wanna caution against, uh, and I'm not saying you're saying this, but I'm, 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 there's some, uh, 
some discursive reverb in my reverb in my ear, right? There's something when you say it, it kind of bounces, and I hear something else. So I'm not saying you're saying it, right? Is that also uh, is, is that jump? Oftentimes, folks want to jump to reconciliation quick, without ever acknowledging the asymmetry of power. You can't have reconciliation without the acknowledgement of the asymmetry of power. Or you get South Africa. Reconciled country, massive expansion in black poverty. Because there was no acknowledgement of the asymmetry of power on the question of land. 87% of the people live on 13% of the land and 13% of the people live on 87% of the land. That's not reconciled. That's a reification of neoliberal economic logic in which the, while the ANC picked down, put down their arms and the people picked up poverty. So part of that is that how do you talk about reconciling and being in relationship with people without, but that includes acknowledging the asymmetry of power in the relationship. So oftentimes people want to jump to, well, we need to go, you know, do work directly with the police. The police in black communities are occupying forces. They're everywhere. My entire childhood was pulled over, police sticking their hands down my pants. You know what I'm saying? They're occupying forces in black communities. And I'm going to be a little slow to reconcile particularly when you're still doing it. It's not like you had a reconciliation meeting and they stopped. Right? It's not like we get to know each other's name and they just stop giving a whole bunch of us tickets for no reason. So, people, you know, so like, how are we working with the police? He just hogtied one of my friends and just tear gas me, and gonna be back here tomorrow. There's no reconciling with immoral systems. There isn't. There's proximate justice, there's the possibility of rest rest uh, restorative justice in the context of a morally bankrupt criminal justice system. There's some good that can happen after the evil but it's still nonetheless evil. This is why the question of a revolutionary nonviolence and militant nonviolence civil disobedience is perhaps the essential, the, the first question is what will FOR's role be in terms of supporting this particular moment and these young folks? And the second probably most important question for the Fellowship of Reconciliation is that what does it mean by nonviolence? And is it gonna be robust? Is it gonna be direct confrontation with the state? Is it going to be putting bodies on the line, like these, following the lead of these young people in the street? Because that's what they've been doing. And that reconciliation only happens. Reconciliation is much like the Paulinian construction of salvation. It is happening. It has not happened. We are being reconciled. But we're yet to achieve reconciliation. It's Fanon's notion that we struggle not only for the benefit of struggle, which is freedom, but we benefit from the process. So when I struggle to become free, we become freer people. We walk differently, we talk different, we get a little less homophobic and we get a little less sexist and a little less racist, right? Because we all of it, all of us in this room are. And so we just get a little better, right? And so we're being reconciled into our beingness over time and space and we'll never fully arrive. That's the beautiful thing about it. That's why we got to have joy on the journey. Hi, uh, I have a quick question. Um, what do you consider to be the root of all these issues in the world? The what? The root, like the cause or the reason. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so, you see, see, this is why I don't like young people. That right there. So I don't like them. You know, like, you're going to wait to the end. 
and then asked me to, uh, you know, to answer, is there, you know, is there a God? And give you some material evidence. And he's, I'm just, I may not even answer your damn question. <laughs> God, I don't like him. I, so, you know, dear brother, I think this is the question that all humanity is wrestled with. We see it on the ancient tombs, people wrestling with the question in these little carvings about calamity and catastrophe. I mean, we do know that part of human existence has always been the risk of annihilation. Like we see it on the caves. And we do know that there's always been in those communities a certain kind of magic, that there have been a certain group of people who have been set aside, whose moral and, responsi and ethical responsibility was to interpret the signs and wonders, often the sun and the moon and the stars. So we do know that about human existence. And one way they've attempted to articulate and explain and make some sense of the calamity and the catastrophe that they're facing has been through the, these various forms of shamans. This is through all of human history. And so whatever that calamity or Cornell West calls the catastrophe is, whether it be volcanoes erupting and erasing entire civilizations, whether it be an ice age, that perhaps that kind of volcano and physical catastrophe has took on both metaphoric and, and environmental meaning. So the part of what we're dealing with in terms of the root of this calamity and this catastrophe and the way in which it has infected the ecology of human existence is racism. And so those of us who have certain didactics and are engaged in certain binaries that have certain use because there is, there is wrong and right, there is good and evil. And so it's the problem of evil that we are facing is the kind of calamity and catastrophe that is, has that is caused that, this idea that any human is outside and Christianity in certain limited form and certain ways in which we describe our ideology, we talk about the way that the hell is the absence of the love of God. Right? And so we can we to be sure for now, for me, in terms of to be a bit theological about the whole matter, is that if there be a God, that God is incapable of not loving. It's the only kind I can believe in and it's worth it. You know, and he's been falling up, and particularly if, given the level of crisis that we're facing in the world right now, God is definitely a man, because a woman wouldn't put up with this. <laughs> oh, you think you're just gonna let 40,000 children die every day on, with the, without clean drinking water? Woman would be like, you must be out of your mind. Wouldn't be happening. But in all seriousness, I think that so it's the problem of catastrophe and calamity in terms of those ancient old human story, fa people facing extinction, extinction. And now they're facing it vis a vis the various forms of evil that they've created themselves. But I know that is a very fatalistic assessment of this particular moment. But I got joy. And let me end on that note, though. In this work, we got to have joy. I don't want to be part of the movement. I ain't got no joy. I ain't got no pleasure. So we got to live. Right? Pace yourself. This is a long distance race. And you must love the people more than they hate themselves. But you got to have joy. Laugh. Live. Be close to one another. Trust one another. Love each other through the darkness. Make fun of each other. Bury each other's dead. And have joy. I get up every day and I do what I was born to do. I'm not a rich man. I never will be. But I look out in the audience and I get a chance to see y'all. I'd be like, 
damn it, I ain't wasted my 